Are you old enough to remember what 2008 to 10 was like in America? A lot of bad things happened at the same time. China is in line for something much worse because when our banks and our real estate system collapsed and our economy was hit by that, real estate was in the high teens as a percent of our economy. And that was a lot. And it went down a lot after that. But real estate had taken over our economy to, to a large degree. China, at its peak, real estate was about 30% of its economy. Much, much higher. About almost twice as high as, as the percent of real estate in the U.S. economy at our highest. And so that's, like, that's epic. That is so much of their real economy that they're going to take a bigger hit than we did. Next, the Chinese banking system is not only largely state-controlled, but massively opaque. We don't know who's lent money to who. Only the government knows that. If the government even knows that, government will be deeply, deeply involved in determining who takes these losses. And so who gets paid back, which bonds default, who takes the losses for failed real estate you know, investments that people thought were going to be worth a lot of money and now are turning out not to be worth a lot of money. I predict that the next five to 10 years in China will be a giant game of hot potato. Welcome to Econ 102, where economist Noah Smith and I make sense of what's happening in the news, technology, business, and beyond through the lens of economics. Let's jump right in. Uh, well, Noah, excited to, excited to do this. Excited to have you back from your trip. Welcome back. Thanks. Good to be back. And uh, so you were in Japan for a bit. We're going to talk about China today, but we'll, maybe let's start with uh, Japan briefly. Any, uh, any highlights or uh, uh, key takeaways from your trip worth, uh, worth sharing? Well, you know, I mean... I've been noticing the last uh, two years that I've been to Japan um, since I started going after the pandemic that Japan is a bit poorer than it used to be, which is to say that living standards are about what they were 15 years ago. And yet people are working harder than ever. Um, and, and not because of the old system where people, you know, companies sort of made people stay at their desks for, for you know, forever, basically. That system still exists in some places, but it's mostly on the way out. Instead, it's just that wages are very low, so people push themselves to work for you know extra hours so they can afford a decent lifestyle. Um, and it's it's you know painful to watch because Japan has suffered a dearth of investment, slow productivity growth, and you have all these young people who have to work really hard to support all the old people because it's one of the most uh, aged countries in the world. And um, and it's a really difficult thing to see. And so I'm thinking pretty hard about how to revitalize Japan's economy. And so I'll be writing about that you know, in the near future, sort of what, what can we do to kind of bring Japan back here? Cool. Um, well, yeah, we will uh, cover, go do a deep dive in J uh, Japan when, after you write that, that piece, perhaps. We're, we're, let's segue to, to China then, because there's a, there's a lot going on. And you had this recent blog post about how uh, you know, the, what's happening in China won't mean sort of the, uh, the end of the global economy, um, or you're more sanguine about what uh what, what what will happen what why don't we uh why don't we unpack that right so um what's been in the economic news in the last few days is just chinese economic carnage you've had real estate developers defaulting shadow banks defaulting you've had you know the government kind of frantically cutting interest rates you've had uh china slipping into deflation you've had exports crashing um and imports going down too You've had um, just any number of bad new pieces of bad news out of China. And so there's this big consensus, and the consensus is correct, that China's real estate bubble has popped and that this is kind of the hard landing of the Chinese economy that people have been waiting for for, you know, over a decade. Say more about what, what that means or what, what that implies or, or what, what, why write this post then? Right. So, you know, I guess the first question that a lot of people are going to ask is, oh, no, does this mean I'm in trouble? Does this mean my job is in trouble? Does this mean my investments are in trouble? Uh, and the answer, if you live in the United States, is probably no, it's not. You're not in trouble, actually. In fact, you'll probably benefit from this ultimately. Uh, you know, that's a little grim to say because it's not great to benefit from other people's troubles. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I think Americans will generally benefit. There are some other countries that could be hurt. Uh, so, so what should we cover first? Should we talk about the U.S. first? Yes, let's do that. Right. So um, U.S. banks are not very exposed to China. And U.S. exports to China are actually relatively modest. Um, and U.S. 
you know, companies don't actually make as much in China as companies from, say, Europe or, or you know, some countries in Asia. And so we're relatively insulated on the real economic side and on the financial side from any sort of carnage in the Chinese economy. But on the macro side, we stand to benefit enormously. So when China, when China's economy slows, it will cause disinflation. It will fight against inflation throughout the global economy through three mechanisms. The first is just slowing economic growth. The third is that Chinese demand for oil and other commodities uh, will go down, which will just make, you know, metals and oil and all that stuff food cheaper for the rest of us and then finally uh, the chinese currency will depreciate meaning that the stuff we do buy from china will become cheaper and we will get price cuts on that so overall inflation will go down uh, as a result of this chinese crash and when inflation goes down it makes the federal reserve feel safe about cutting interest rates so you know interest rates have stopped rising they're i think five and a half percent now and um that's a reasonably high level, uh, at least relative to, to recent levels. And, um, and it, a lot of people sort of expect that to plateau for a long time, or at least for, you know, a year or two before, you know, un until the Fed is really certain that inflation is back to its target. But uh, if, if, you know, weakness in the Chinese economy pushes down on the rate of inflation, that makes it a lot easier for the Fed to cut interest rates. And they're going to cut interest rates a lot sooner. They're going to start cutting sooner. And when they cut interest rates, it means cheaper mortgages. It means house prices, uh, you know, will rise. It means, um, uh, you know, the economy will expand. And so basically, this is good for us. And it also means that the United States banking system will become stronger. Because if you remember back to the collapse of Silicon Valley Bank earlier this year, the reason that happened and the reason some other regional banks collapsed and the reason, you know, some of the banking system was looking shaky is because the banks had bought all these treasury bonds. And when interest rates go up, the value of bonds goes down. So the banks had taken a huge loss on their assets, on their investment portfolios of bonds from these rate hikes. And so when the rate hikes are reversed, you know, the, the banks still have a lot of bonds. And so when the rate hikes are reversed, bank balance sheets will become strengthened and the financial system will feel more comfortable lending to the real economy. And so for all these reasons, um, China's slowdown will actually help the United States via disinflation, which will allow lower interest rates. So is there is there no downside for the U.S.? Not really, um, I'm, unless China decides to start World War III because it's you know <laughs> trying to distract from its economic problems or something like that. What would need to be true for you to, or what would need to change in order for you to be worried about you at like uh, when something like this might, might happen? What is the, what is the usual potential concern? Well, I'd, I'd have to learn about a source of financial exposure to China that I wasn't aware of, and I don't think I'm going to. You know, I don't think that there is any sort of um, banking exposure to China out there that I don't know about. I think the, the standard figures are right. Um, there's no other real channel by which uh, China's uh, slowdown could really hurt us. Um, there are some indirect things that could happen to hurt us a tiny bit through hurting some economies that we trade with or you know, of, of some of our allies. So this, that's a good opportunity for segue. Uh, let's talk about the UK. So European and Japanese banks, Korean banks are similarly not very exposed to China. Uh, there are a couple banks that are incredibly exposed to China, the most exposed being HSBC, which was sort of a, it's a British bank created to invest in China. And so I think somewhere, uh, at least a year ago, somewhere around a third of its assets uh, or were, were related to China in some way. And, um, and what that means is that if, if those assets kind of go poof and China decides to make a British bank kind of take the fall for its economic uh, losses here on real estate stuff, then we could see Britain's largest bank collapse. And an another British bank called Standard Chartered is also fairly exposed, though less than HSBC, but a lot more than any other bank. And so it's possible that lar two large British banks could fail um, within rapid succession. And if so, that will hurt Britain's economy, which is already honestly doing pretty crappy. And so we could see the UK have some trouble. I don't think there's going to be a lot of blowback from that to the United States, um, just because, you know, the UK is not that huge. And um, but I think it could it could cause some shockwaves. It could cause some consternation. Uh, you know, when you saw one of Switzerland's biggest banks collapse the other day, uh, Credit Suisse, um, it didn't really cause any problems in the United States at all. And so I think that Britain's 
you know, two of Britain's largest banks collapsing would be a little worse for us, but not amazingly. But it will be bad for people in the UK um, because they'll make an already bad economic climate worse. And so that brings us to the, sort of the third category of, of countries that could be affected by this, uh, which are resource exporters. And they could definitely be hurt. So, for example, Australia, Argentina, Brazil, a lot of poor countries in Africa. Uh, a lot of these countries make their money selling natural resources, you know, Chile, Norway. Um, and when when resource prices go down, that's great for us, right? Because we're a resource consumer. But these resource producers um, throughout, you know, the global south and also some places like Australia um, will be hurt. They'll be hurt. And so because, you know, Chinese demand will go down. But, you know, honestly, falling resource prices are going to hurt resource exporters. And that's not a reason to keep resource prices high. You know, it's not necessarily good to have expensive, super expensive metal and oil and stuff right. just because it puts money in the pockets of Australia. Yeah. And so describe the mechanism by which um, this leads to reduced inflation. Uh, exactly. First of all, headline inflation, which is just the CPI number you see quoted in the news, uh, will include, um, you know, oil and commodities and things like that. Energy and food uh, are included in that even though they're not included in something called core inflation, which the Fed pays more attention to when it makes policy. But you know, lower oil prices are really important because that lowers gas prices. So people, Americans will pay less at the pump. You know, and that, uh, that matters for a lot of people. People pay less for food at the grocery store. That matters for a lot of people. And so, so those will happen. The second way is a more indirect way. Oil and metals uh, are inputs into um into industry right you know we have a lot of manufacturers who make stuff and also you know just any company needs to you know burn oil to keep the lights on or or run its server racks or whatever right you need you use energy and so um cheaper production inputs mean more production so businesses can scale up when you get cheap energy um, when you get cheap inputs, you can suddenly say, okay, business is booming. Let's invest. Let's build, you know? And so that's, and that's good. And so those, and, and that reduces core inflation because the stuff that those businesses are making are like, you know, I don't know, housing or insurance or cars or computers or blah, 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 a million things. And so, um, so all of that feeds through. So those are the two ways that those falling resource prices will lower our inflation. Got it. Let me zoom out and summarize what we got so far. So right now, basically this real estate crash that you've been, you know, worrying about or writing about, and we covered in episode three is actually starting to happen. One of the, you know, the, the, some of the big developers uh, are, are, are defaulting or looking like they're going to default and that's having spill, spillover effects. Is that an accurate way of summarizing what's happening right now? Yes, absolutely. And so as a result, that is likely going to unexpectedly have good effects outside of China, or at least for the US or for England, perhaps? Yes, uh, England could be hurt, but the United States, right. I think Europe, uh, Japan, Korea, all these countries will mostly benefit from China's slowdown. Yeah, and it's gonna reduce inflation by the mechanism by which you just described, which means that we'll be able to cut rates and that will st perhaps stimulate the economy. Yes. And so let's talk about China then. What happens here from now? They are in big, big trouble. <laughs> Um, a lot of bad things happen. Um, are you uh, are you, are you old enough to remember um, what two thousand eight to ten was like in America? I mean, you were a you were a college kid, right? Yeah, I was I was a college so the financial crisis, um, right? No, when big, I was a college kid, I didn't know what those things meant. <laughs> you know, I didn't even care. Yeah. yeah. But did you? How, how cognizant were you of this, this terrible economic thing that happened to America? I remember that my sister and her peers had you know graduated around this time and couldn't get jobs and you know, they were they were you know petrified and uh, things like this. But no, I, I was largely a student, so I don't I don't really you know internalize. Right, right, so right. I didn't feel yeah, the pain. So then, so it was you know it was bad because what happened was that all the the several things happened. The banks uh, were very weak because suddenly all these loans on their books looked like they weren't going to pay off. And that made them very reluctant to lend, sometimes legally unable to lend, but sometimes just scared of lending because, you know, they, they, were, gonna, they were losing a lot of money and they needed cash to stay, to stay solvent. And, um, and because they stopped lending, that really threw a wrench in the real economy because nobody could get a bank loan. And um, so that was a problem. 
also households suddenly um their behavior changed you know in the 2000s people had been really like spend spend my house is going up by so much i can afford to take out these loans and just buy everything and live this fabulous life and then you know the house prices crash people think oh god you know i get better pay down my debts and um and this is this is called a balance sheet recession there's an economist named richard ku who talks about this a lot so those are two bad things that happened um you know tax revenues collapsed and so government services sort of collapsed um government stopped paying for roads for schools for all kinds of things because they just couldn't um because they had state governments had balanced budget amendments etc and um and so a lot of bad things happened at the same time china is in line for something much worse but along the same lines but much worse because uh when when our um when our banks and our real estate system and our con you know collapsed and our economy was hit by that real estate was uh i don't know in the high teens as a percent of our economy and that was a lot and it went down a lot after that but real estate had taken over our economy to, to a large degree china at its peak real estate was about 30 percent of its economy much much higher about almost twice as high as as the percent of real estate in the u.s economy at our highest and so that's like that's epic that is so much of their real economy that they're going to take a bigger hit than we did. Next, the Chinese banking system is not only largely state controlled, but massively opaque. We don't know who's lent money to who. Only the government knows that if the government even knows that. And I'm sure people will be trying <laughs> to keep it from the government. But then government will be deeply, deeply involved in determining who takes these losses. Yeah. And so who gets paid back, which bonds default, who takes the losses for failed real estate, uh, you know, investments um, that people thought were going to be worth a lot of money and now are turning out not to be worth a lot of money. And so, um, yeah. And so I, I predict that the next five to 10 years in China will be a giant game of hot potato where everybody basically tries to avoid being the person who is on the hook for these losses where, you know, um, Everybody just says, well, don't stick me with the loss, stick someone else. But someone has to be stuck with the loss. Chinese people cannot be as rich at the yeah. end of this process as they all thought they were at the beginning of this process. And um, it, it reminds me of Tyler Cowen in the aftermath of the Great Recession saying, we're not as rich as we thought we were. Well, that's exactly what's happened to China now. And they're not as rich as they thought they were. And they have to decide who will, be, will still be rich after the fallout and who will be ruined. And that will involve, a, because China's system you know, so entwined with the government and thus so opaque, this is going to involve a lot of knife fights, political fights, you know, fraud, business fights, you know, whatever, um, that we would work out through mostly through the legal system in the United States. Right. If you're a startup founder or executive running a growing business, you know that as you scale, your systems break down and the cracks start to show. If this resonates with you, there are three numbers you need to know. 36,000, 25, and one. 36,000. That's the number of businesses which have upgraded to NetSuite by Oracle. NetSuite is the number one cloud financial system, streamlined accounting, financial management, inventory, HR, and more. 25. NetSuite turns 25 this year. That's 25 years of helping businesses do more with less, close their books in days, not weeks, and drive down costs. One, because your business is one of a kind, so you get a customized solution for all your KPIs in one efficient system with one source of truth. Manage risk get reliable forecasts, and improve margins. Everything you need, all in one place. Right now, download NetSuite's popular KPI checklist, designed to give you consistently excellent performance, absolutely free, at netsuite.com slash turpentine. That's netsuite.com slash turpentine to get your own KPI checklist. netsuite.com slash turpentine. And so if you were calling the shots, uh, you were you using Bing, like, Obviously, you have all bad options here, it seems, but w w what would you decide? Like, how, w w what is a, a strategy that they should develop or adopt? So the best strategy is to support the real economy through consumption. The best strategy is to simply mail checks to Chinese people so that they can spend on stuff, right? Uh, China traditionally invests a huge amount of its GDP. We, we tend to think of Japan and Korea as having invested a lot, uh, you know, during their run-ups. We, we saw them building lots of stuff. They don't invest nearly as much of their GDP as China. China just builds oceans of cars and, you know, oceans of high-speed rail and oceans of, uh, you know, roads, highways, soaring apartment towers, massive office complexes, malls, 
everything you can possibly think of, you know, ports, airports, everywhere, China just builds it all. And they just invest so much. And that needs to stop. That is wasteful. Those investments aren't going to be paid back. China just invests so much of its, its GDP that um, those investments aren't going to pay off and it's throwing good money after bad and it's doing these wasteful investments. And so it needs to, to stop. It needs to rebalance its economy toward consumption. And um, this is Michael Pettis' thesis, and it's correct. And if you look at it through a Keynesian lens of they need to stimulate aggregate demand, it says the exact same thing. Normal people need to spend more. And normal people are not spending more. They're saving a lot of money. Chinese people are saving, saving, saving all this money in cash. Now, is that good? Well, you know, sometimes, you know, during boom times, people say saving is great because it all goes to fund investment. Uh, and investment's what we need, you know, build more stuff. And, and sure, up to a point. But uh, when you're in a recession, especially one caused by a financial crisis, which will, tends to be a deep and long recession, then having everyone try to save at once is not good because everyone tries to save and what do they do? They hold cash. And when they hold cash, that means they're not buying stuff in the real economy. So what happens? Well, prices go down, but demand goes down. Companies produce less because nobody's buying, right? So companies produce less. They lay people off. People are either poorer or in danger of being poorer. So what do they do? They save more. And so you get this, this spiral and it's called the paradox of thrift. Hmm. Everyone's trying to save money, but everyone trying to save money at the same time makes the economy poorer. It's a very, you know, it's an unintuitive thing to understand. It can lead to lots and lots of strange behavior. A lot of the str economic strangeness that we saw in, you know, from 2008 to 2011 was because of this paradox of thrift. Yeah. And so, yeah. And so basically Chinese people need to go out and spend and, um, and stimulus, you know, a consumption based stimulus can help goose the economy to make Chinese people go out and spend. Uh, unfortunately, the leadership in China is strongly against this. Why is that? Well, first of all, the people who rule China are a lot more like sort of boomer Republicans than we think. Huh. They think um, consumption is bad. You know, like people shouldn't, people should uh, just work really hard, produce stuff, and then, and then not consume too much. They think welfare is bad. Hmm. They think it'll make people lazy. If they just hand out checks, that'll make you lazy. Then you won't work. And then, um, you know, they basically, uh, yeah, there was even some, some quote in the Wall Street Journal. Uh, you know, actually, let me, let me find that quote because it was just, there, there was a really good story in the Wall Street Journal that, that was just about how China's era of catch-up growth is now over. Here's the quote. Uh, the leadership also worries that empowering individuals to make more decisions over how they spend their money could undermine state authority without generating the kind of growth Beijing desires. So, oh no, we can't let you spend your money because then you might get to decide how money is spent and not us. But is the problem or with mailing people checks is just, what if they just decide to save it? Like, how, how, are, we, how are we sure that they're going to con consume it? No, but um, it will do something. It will move the needle at least. And, and there's this thing called the multiplier effect where you can trigger this virtuous cycle. Uh, sometimes this is called pump priming. Um, and so you pay some money to somebody and then they spend some of it. And then that becomes income for some companies, which raise employment a bit. And then some people get some more money, some of which they spend and they get more confidence to spend more and it just creates this virtuous cycle. And how big that multiplier is, is the subject of much economic debate, but it seems that the multiplier tends to be much bigger during a bad recession when people are scared. So now is the time to do that. Yeah. And, and so what is the best comp for this situation? Is, is it 2008 actually, or, or what are? Yeah. 2008, um, Japan had a similar experience in the early nineties. Um, Sweden did too, although no one noticed cause it's small. Um, and then there, of course there was the great depression. Yeah. You know, honestly, the great depression in the United States might be a better, uh, comp for this, but we don't know yet. Obviously if I, I think China's going into recession, but a great depression would be just, you know, an order of magnitude larger than what they've experienced so far, it would be really, really bad. Uh, we think that economies are more resilient, globalization is more resilient um, than it was in the 30s. Um, information is more plentiful and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. 
then we think, oh, China couldn't possibly go into a Great Depression. But I would say that's the worst case scenario is something like what the United States experienced in the 1930s. But I would say the, the best case scenario is probably something like what Japan experienced. You know, Japan had the slowdown for a decade uh, after the bursting of its real estate bubble, but it didn't, living standards didn't go down. You didn't see mass unemployment. You didn't see armies of like unemployed people in the streets, social unrest, all this stuff. You know, people mostly just went out and like made art, you know, I mean, some, there, there was a rise in suicide, so I shouldn't, uh, you know, make light of this, but, um, but Japan, thanks to plentiful stimulus that the government dished out and thanks to um, other sort of measures to preserve employment, never had, never had a Great Depression after 1991. And um, so I think that's sort of a good outcome for China. Everyone talks about Japanification being the bad outcome. That's the good outcome. The bad outcome is U.S. Great Depression. Hmm. And if you were to predict what you think over the next 10 years, China's growth might look like, what, what would you predict? 3%, uh, an annual rate of 3%. That seems reasonable. That is actually slightly higher now than the developed countries. The developed countries grow around 2%, um, sure. or maybe even 1.5% for some of these very rapidly aging countries. Um, but I think China, 3%, that, that's not me going out on a limb either. That's sort of a consensus forecast, but I think that that's kind of what we're looking at. Also, you know, there's research on these, um, these economic slowdowns that developing countries experience. Most countries experience two. Occasionally, they'll experience three, but usually two. And um, the first slowdown happened to China in the early 2010s. Yeah. The growth basically dropped from 10% to 6%. So you had a four-point slowdown. Wow. Um, and then so in the, in the 2010s, we came to think of China as an economy that grows at 6% rather than an economy that grows at 10%. But 6 and 10 are both so much higher than our growth rate that maybe we didn't notice. Also, a percentage growth rate when you're you know, China was richer in the 2010s than it was in the 2000s. So we just saw much more stuff. You know, we saw these forests of skyscrapers and these oceans of cars and ships, you know, like being built. And so um, so that that 6% still seemed big and majestic, even though it actually represented a substantial slowdown. Now, China has had the second slowdown right on time, actually. If you look at the paper that predicts this uh, by Barry Eich and Green, and then um, uh, also Park and Shin, um, they, uh, they, they predict the timing of this very well. And so China has now undergone its, its second slowdown. And the 3% will probably peter out to 2% in the 30s. Hmm. And, but then, but the era of rapid Chinese catch up growth is pretty much, it is done. It's over. Yeah. And so what does this mean for sort of the US China, uh, you know, geopolitical si situation r r with what's happening right now? Well, damn, I wish I knew, man, you know, like, um, because it, I can spin you all kinds of tales. Like, you know, maybe Xi Jinping thinks, okay, well now that economic growth isn't rapid, there's less to lose from war sure. cause you know, who worries, I, I'm not worried about disrupting the economic system when the economic system's kind of in the shitter anyway. Right. And so, uh, you know, also they might look at us history. If, if it does get as bad as the great depression, they might look at us history and see the way that we finally got employment back to its pre-depression levels was world war II mobilization. They might say, okay, well let's just go to war with America over Taiwan and the war mobilization will restore full employment and prevent social unrest. So that's, that's a possibility, you know, that's, uh, that, that, that might, that, that might, um, move them to go to war. But I don't actually know how likely those scenarios are. And it's also possible they'll say, well, our economy's weak. Let's wait. Let's not go to war while the economy's weak. Let's focus on getting this economy strong again so that when we do go to war, we'll be stronger. Yeah. Um, that's a possibility they might do that. So I can't really say. It might be that there's internal unrest. And instead of trying to invade Taiwan or attack the United States in order to allay internal unrest, China Chinese leaders will become entirely preoccupied with kind of crushing their domestic opponents and, and crushing the unrest and ignore the outside world for a while. And that could happen too. You know, that's sort of what sometimes happened with the Soviet Union. And, um, and in fact, China too, actually, sometimes that happens to them. So the answer is I have no clue and I can spin you all these scenarios, but I can't really tell you which of these scenarios are more likely. Do you think this is a slow sort of burn or do you think this happens really quick or how do you foresee this? I mean, the, the real estate crash, is, is being slowed by the fact that the government controls all the banks. Yeah. So, um, and also people aren't selling their houses. So you don't, you see some price declines, but you don't see as enormous price declines as you might. Um, there's a lot of, of unsold houses that are not on the market that would, 
you know, if people try to sell them, they will crash the market even more. Um, so that could, that could, they, they call that extend and pretend, right? Yeah. Um, banks can encourage people not to, to sell or, uh, you know, it can, it can do something called evergreening of loans where you basically give cheap loans to, um, to your portfolio companies to roll over their own loans so that you don't look like an insolvent bank. Um, that's a thing that happened in Japan a lot after their burst bubble. Um, so you can have, you know, those kind of things and the, and the government can paper over stuff for a while. And that's, you know, with through an extend and pretend strategy. So I think that, um, if the government goes all in on extend and pretend, which I kind of suspect they will, then we're looking at five years before this, the fallout from this really starts to clear up. Wow. Our, um, our mutual friend Balaji in recent months has liked hmm. to talk about, um, China as a sort of, uh, I don't know if he says peacemaker, but you, you post sort of the sort of uh, sanctions against Russia. He pointed to articles talking about how China was, be, you know, flexing its diplomatic muscles and doing more partnerships with with uh, other countries, particularly economic partnerships, and perhaps maybe there would be more trust in the in the you know sort of Chinese currency and in, in, in China as a as a player on that stage. Is that was that overstated to begin with, and is that like bye bye now? Yes, it was very overstated to begin with. Balaji was primarily wrong about this. China has the opportunity to play peacemaker, but it does not have the skill to do so, even if it has the desire. And um, as we've seen with Belt and Road uh, and with the Wolf Warrior diplomats of 2021 or whatever, um, China's, uh, China's foreign policy acumen is terrible. Yeah. China, to an even greater degree, basically China has all the problems America has, but worse. <laughs> uh, they're sort of like- Which ones? Uh, well, the Chinese people think that China's the whole world. Hmm. You know, and then when they go out in the actual whole world and then try to deal with people who aren't there, they try to deal with them as, as they would people in China and it doesn't work. So, you know, they went for the Belt and Road. They went out and tried to basically steamroll local governments to create these infrastructure developments in other countries, just like they'd steamroll their own local governments. But guess what? It doesn't work. And you can't just take peasants land in, in Balochistan or, or wherever. They will blow up your pipeline <laughs> and you can't do that, you know, and you can't. Um, yeah, and so so they got a rude awakening there, but it was their their understanding of other countries was bad because they were so big and so used to dealing with them defensively. So Belt and Road has been negative for China. Absolutely giant fiasco. Wow, there's pretty much no one who'll get up and and stand up and defend it at this point. Was it a good idea, bad, just terribly executed, or was it just a bad idea? Uh it was a good idea, terribly executed. I would say um, because we have seen more modest, but much more fruitful and lucrative infrastructure efforts that have led to diplomatic successes by Japan. Yeah. So Japan got this right and China got this wrong. Right. And, and to, and to the, the steel man case for the, or the, the bull case originally was that China was going to, um, sort of build up certain, re, you know, regions. When you explain Belt and Road, like what was the hope and promise? Right. Belt so the idea, the idea of Belt and Road was that China was supposed to invest in infrastructure in a bunch of other countries that would then um, bind those countries closer to China politically, uh, you know, especially because their economies would be helped. And so they'd be grateful to China. Um, it would also give China some port facilities and road and pipeline facilities that it could use in the event of war or just to strengthen its supply chains or whatever. And then uh, it would also provide a bunch of payola and money for Chinese contractors. Yeah. So kill three birds with one stone. The first reason it didn't work is because they executed badly. As I said, the projects were planned terribly. They were not planned with an eye to a good return on investment. Most of them failed, uh, and almost all of them failed. Really, there was a there was a short high speed rail line in in Jakarta that actually kind of worked, but everything like pretty much failed. And um, instead of investing the money through equity, they loaned the countries the money. So that when the projects failed, the they the Chinese you know lenders went to the Chinese government and were like make them pay us back. And the Chinese government, basically, it's like, okay, so if I lend you money to kick peasants off their land and build infrastructure that makes no return and is economically terrible, and then I demand all the money back that I loaned you to build this shit, what, what are you going to think of me? Right. You'll think, there is a jerk. You know, what did you do? You just left me, like, poor and in debt, and I got nothing out of this except this road that no one uses or, you know, the port <laughs> that no one uses. Um, and so then in Sri Lanka... What happened was they bas Sri Lanka basically said, okay, you can just have the port. We're going to default on our debt. The, port, the debt was collateralized with the port itself. Take the port. 
So China owns a Sri Lankan city now. That's kind of ridiculous. <laughs> and does China recognize that it's been a massive failure or are they tripling down? I mean, uh, no, no, no. They've been pulling investment out uh, while, while rhetorically saying, oh, yeah, this is the greatest success ever. You know, record grain harvest comrade or whatever. They, um, <laughs> there are no Americans in Baghdad. I don't know. They just bullshit. <laughs> and so, uh, but, but yeah, they, they know. They know it well, failed. When, were, when was your peak bullishness? on China, because it feels like a few years ago, people were really excited about China's prospects. You know, the US was certain we were worried about the US prospects relative to China. And then it just feels like a number of own goals uh, on, right. on the part of China. So so ch I was most bullish on China during the Hu Jintao era, because China was still poor. It, it was it was growing through foreign direct investment, you know, FDI was really robust. Exports were really robust, and diplomatically, it was doing the right things. It was it was essentially shelving the whole idea of invading Taiwan, uh, you know, and pursuing a policy of detente uh, with Taiwan, um, and uh, and really just just continuing to follow the Deng Xiaoping playbook. And so, so those who don't know, Deng Xiaoping is the Chinese leader who made all the reforms and basically canceled Mao era communism and implemented essentially state control of key sectors combined with libertarian capitalism and all the other sectors. And, um, and then he picked his two successors, Jiang Zemin and Hu Jintao, who then ruled the country up until 2012. And so from, you know, I don't remember exactly when Deng took power, 1978 or nine. Um, he, uh, from that through 2012, the China had good emperors, three, the three good emperors of China were Deng, Zhang, and Hu. And they were all picked by Deng. So Deng was really the great man of Chinese history. Um, when Xi Jinping got in in 2012, he started undoing the legacy of Deng in a big way. He was the first leader not picked by, by Deng. Um, and he, uh, he won power. In, there was a factional struggle where he actually had the leader of the rival faction, Bo Xi Lai, uh, jailed for life. I, at first, I wasn't really paying attention to what she, changes Xi Jinping was making. So I can say I was bullish on China in 2012, 2013, maybe even 2014. But that was primarily because I was paying attention to other things. And I didn't notice how quickly she was changing things. And it was when I started talking to Chinese people in America that, you know, I realized that Xi Jinping was something different. He was a, a, a different beast than the, the Chinese leaders had been before. And so I started looking at what he was doing and I started to get worried. And my worries were all borne out and more so. And in 2014, what were you seeing that, that caused you to worry? Um, so he, he was cracking down on a law, uh, on civil society. So he cracked down on lawyers, on unions, on writers, on all these people that had honestly kind of flourished under Hu Jintao. It was an era of, of cultural liberalization, but she cracked down on all of them. Um, economically, he began to build up the role of the state a bit more at the time. I didn't know how much he would eventually do that. It was a lot, but he started doing that. Um, he, uh, but most, most scarily, he crushed the communist youth league. And when I saw him do that, I was like, wow, that's r deep factional politics. There is, you know, he did the anti-corruption drive, which some people hailed as a success, but honestly, a lot of that was just purging all political opponents and, and seizing personal control. And I, I kind of saw that, I was, you know, especially from Chinese people that I talked to, I was like, okay, so that's what he's doing. He's seizing personal control with anti-corruption drive. And, uh, and that never ends well because there's a certain type of leader who is amazing at entering an existing organization bureaucracy and taking it over from the inside. And Joseph Stalin is the paragon of this. He's, he was amazing. He, he was the master of personnel. You know, he, he appointed all his cronies to key positions and he made all his cronies be rivals with each other so they wouldn't challenge him and would be utterly indebted to him. So he had this team of rivals among his cronies and they were all incompetent and the Soviet Union sucked under Stalin, but he was amazing at taking control of the, of the Soviet Communist Party of the, you know. Um, and so uh, Lenin was the man who built that organization, but Stalin was this, this guy who entered it and, and took it over. And I recognized in Xi Jinping, I started to recognize the same type of guy, this, this organization man. Um, if you want a lighter analogy, you could say Steve Ballmer. 
<laughs> you know, he, if, if Deng is the Bill Gates, and if Deng Zhang and Hu are the Bill Gates of, of China, then um, Xi Jinping is is the um, is the Steve Ballmer. And you know, uh, Xi Jinping, he he just thinks if he claps his hands and yells like developers, 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 then like the good things will materialize, but they won't. And instead, he's putting out zunes. <laughs> it was Microsoft's attempt to compete with the iPod, and it just oh, wow. absolutely crashed. <laughs> yeah. There was a hope that he would be a Satya, but he's a Steve Ballmer, huh? He's a Steve Ballmer. Um, but even in 2019, 2020, before sort of the COVID zero stuff, I remember people, you know, saying, hey, China is impervious to some of sort of social justice, you know, uh, sort of excessive, you know, stuff that the, uh, the leftism that the U.S. was having trouble with, according to some people. And then also that, you know, China would have um, the right kind of government structure to deal with COVID. Like people were still bullish. Maybe you were, and I'm curious, how was your perspective in 2019, 2020? Because it feels like with zero COVID and some of the other just own goals that they had post 2020, it decreased significantly. Um, so in terms of like, uh, I don't know what, wokeness? Like, I mean, no, just overall, uh, overall society, um, health, um, right. like ability to function, ability to navigate. The, the theory of unrest, of social unrest that I personally buy is called the revolution of rising expectations theory. And it says that when you have a long boom and then stagnation, people get pissed. Uh, that doesn't always happen. Obviously, it didn't happen in Japan. People didn't really get that pissed. Uh, it, I think it did happen in America. I think that the frustration of the dreams of the millennial generation, as well as the... Uh, you know, the fact that America had taken so many hits in a short period of time with the self-inflicted wounds of the Iraq war, plus the, you know, external attack of 9-11, plus the self-inflicted wounds of the of the financial crisis, plus the self-inflicted wounds of Trump and all these things um, happened. And, uh, you know, Americans, millennials were mad, you know, the, the younger generation was mad. And uh, I, I think that, that wokeness is a, a very traditional, you know, sort of American piece of American culture, uh, you can, there were, there were people who were calling themselves the wide awakes back in the early 1800s, you know, who were like abolitionist social reformers, kids marching in the streets. And so, but, but that was one of the ways that it manifested, you know, wokeness, but also like, you know, Bernie leftism, but also like alt-right stuff, you know, just general unrest, people getting pissed. Um, that might happen in China now. It, you know, when people feel frustrated and the only way that they feel they can have an outlet for their frustration is to overturn the existing relations of hierarchy and order and, and, you know, status in society that gets very, that can get very chaotic. And in China, when that got chaotic was in the 1970s and the cultural revolution, late sixties and seventies, uh, during which time, you know, millions of people were killed and brutalized and raped and, you know, starved and just, absolute chaos right for just a decade and then um and then in the united states it's like you know some people losing their job because people got angry at them on twitter yeah like that doesn't mean i like cancel culture but it means that you know cancel culture does not involve burying you up to your neck in the ground and then splitting your skull with a sledgehammer as it did in the cultural revolution it does not involve boiling you in a pot and having the village communally eat you Okay, so let's keep it a little bit in perspective. We had a cultural revolution with a little c, little r. They had it with capital letters. And so the answer is that China can get much, much worse than us about this stuff. And it just, it's just timing, right? It's just, it's just when that happens. And now I don't expect them to return to the cultural revolution, but I do think you could see significant pissed offness at, uh, at the new era of stagnation. And so... Is the right mental model of the sort of Cold War that um, between U.S. and China that it'll sort of um, end up in the same way that the U.S. and, and Russia with, with one side just kind of collapsing as opposed to a dead conflict? I don't think so, because I, I think that as as many as many faults as China's system has, it is not as pathological as the Soviet Union. Um, one thing we've learned uh, is that there is sort of a you know, there's the Russia factor in everything that happens to Russia, which is that Russia sucks at everything. Um, 
you know, it makes these giant national efforts to like not suck. And then it ends up sucking. And um, China's not that bad, but they're not, they're not as effective as like a, you know, a Germany or South Korea or United States, but they're, but they're more effective than Russia. And I think that they're, you know, um, but, but I still worry. I worry a lot. I worry that the anger will, will manifest not as in Chinese people, you know, like beating up their neighbors. I mean, that would be bad, but then also China just sort of attacking. Um, people forget that, uh, everyone remembers that Germany had hard economic times before the Nazis came to power, but people forget that Japan, you know, had had, uh, the great depression and it did not, it, 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 got out of the Great Depression a little earlier than other people, but it did not escape unscathed. And the labor unrest of the Great Depression was part of what pushed them to fascism and pushed them to abandon the sort of the, the you know, democracy they had had before the, the 30s and sort of pushed them into fascism and militarism and, um, and got a lot of people mad. And basically the outlet for that was attacking Asia. And they just attacked all of Asia. It was, you know, it was never going to work. Um, I really worry about something similar happening with China. Yeah. So you're saying from the U.S. perspective, one uh, a good part of, of China's struggles is, hey, it's less economically uh, p- powerful or l- less competitive in, in some sense. But the bad part is, hey, maybe a, a more desperate China means a more violent China. Uh, That's what I'm scared of, man. Because, I mean, you got to remember, you know, China, even with a, a growth rate of 3%, China still has four times as many people as the United States. Right. Right. And, and, um, yeah. And they have a, also their, their manufacturing is, is almost double ours in terms of output. Uh, in fact, it's about equal to like us and Europe, all of Europe combined. Yeah. Um, and that's a lot. They can make a lot of, and they don't have any NEPA. Right. They don't have any of these problems. They can just roll out massive amounts of stuff. If you look at the massive amounts of production they do on, on a given day of just cars to high speed rail, they built they built so much more high speed rail per person or per mile than Japan ever did. Everyone talks yeah. about the Shinkansen. China has just like Shinkansen's between every little town out there. And, you know, people don't use them. It's, it's a waste. Uh, some some of the lines are waste. And um, but uh but they have them, they built them, they can mobilize vast resources to do these things. And they have this, this, you know, China's, China has a large bulge of population in their fifties, late fifties, and a large bulge of population in their mid thirties. Now in 10 years, China will have a lot fewer young people and a lot more old people to support. If they want to do the war thing, their, their windows closing fast on having a, a bulge of young people to fight. And yeah. so they've got the ability to manufacture untold amounts of stuff, even if it's not the highest quality stuff that would sell for the highest dollar price, whatever, right? They can manufacture infinite of it, just ridiculous amounts. Um, our only hope for stopping them would really be to cut them off from resource imports to choke off that manufacturing ability. Yeah. So that they're a tough opponent. I mean, like, this is the toughest opponent we've ever faced, economic slowdown or not. That doesn't change that. Xi yeah. Jinping being stupid or not. I mean, Hitler was dumb. It didn't make him, you know, less dangerous. Uh, and so, um, not saying Xi Jinping is Hitler. Okay. <laughs> Settle down. But like, I'm just saying that just having a leader who's dumb doesn't mean necessarily that country that's not dangerous. Uh, so it, it's incredibly dangerous. It's, it, it would be the most powerful opponent we've ever faced. And that's why we're scrambling to find alliances, but we are succeeding at that. Do you want me to, do you want me to mention yeah. that a little bit? Please. Yeah, let's go. Into it. Right. So my, my new background photo on Twitter or the app formerly known as Twitter is a picture of Biden um, and the presidents of South Korea and Japan, who just came together in a historic summit arranged by the United States at Camp David, where Japan and Korea, which in the early 2010s, those guys were at each other's throats. Ten years ago, you know, they even talked about going to war with each other. Now they are suddenly friends. And of course, obviously, it's the threat of China that's motivating this, but the United States is actually doing skillful diplomacy. So all you, you know, all you tech guys out there who hate Biden, you're like, Biden, I hate you. You know what? Recognize that getting Japan and Korea to be friends and allies, even with the threat of China, is a pretty amazing feat. Give that one to, to Brandon. All right. <laughs> Give that one to him because that is a really impressive feat. And 
the closest analog I can think of is how Britain and France almost went to war over a little colonial dispute in the years leading up to World War One. And then by the time they realized Germany was a rapidly expanding threat, they became close allies. And there was always a bit of distrust there over the fact that they had gone to war with each other for like hundreds and hundreds of years. But, um, and so there, were, there was never the easiest of alliances, but it was a durable alliance and it held between Britain and France all the way up, you know, till, till modern day. And um, that I think is what's going on with Japan and Korea, but, but Biden is skillful for having brokered that. Biden is also trying to build um, relationships with, so, so we had Modi here in, in the United States. I know a lot of people get pissed at Modi, don't like him. Other people are big fans. He's very controversial. But the United States has decided that geopolitics overrides whatever other concerns might exist and basically says we'll be friends with Modi and Modi's willing to do that. And so it was a very, very like fruitful you know, trip uh, of Modi. And then Biden is now going to Vietnam and he's going to sign a strategic partner agreement with a country that we spent 15 years fighting a brutal war in and like killed millions of their people with napalm. I mean, come on, like what, you know, that's our ally now. You know, alliances change fast. And, you know, for the record, I wish we would have been much less brutal in the Vietnam War. But, um, but it's, it's just astonishing how these old resentments, these old enmities in Asia are rapidly being put aside. Right. I guess the, the, ultimate, the ultimate sign would be India and Pakistan, you know, uh, wow. becoming friends. I don't think we're there yet. I don't think we're there. Yeah. But, um, uh, yeah, so, so basically... All of Asia is sort of slowly moving toward a, being a, a, a block to resist China, but the process is moving slowly. And if China attacked Taiwan tomorrow, it would be the United States, Taiwan, Japan. I don't even think Korea or India would help. Maybe they would provide like some, some material help on the side, but like not get involved directly. Yeah. And, um, and Vietnam couldn't really do anything because they're poor and they're far away. And, um, and it would just be the United States, Japan, and Taiwan versus China if, if that balloon went up tomorrow. So wow. maybe, maybe let, let's, uh, let's, let's, let's wrap on this. What are the questions that short term, medium term that you will be most curious to, to get answered or most looking for? Well, obviously, geopolitically, it's the question of whether China turns outward or turns inward or, as a result of this. Will China try to go to war to distract from a bad economy or will China fall into infighting or, you know, just focus on its own problems. I think that that's, that's the big question. Whether or not there is enough power that's not Xi Jinping dominated within the Communist Party left, whether his domination of the Communist Party is so utter that no one can oppose him, or whether or not there's enough factions elsewhere within the party that they can restrain him, diminish his power, and force him to maybe do some stimulus, you yeah. know, to, to do the smart thing, um, or whether he's just going to stay the course and, and you know, be like a... a true, you know, absolute totalitarian dictator. Uh, unfortunately, I think that's probably more likely. Um, and so, so those are two big questions that I have um, about that. And there's also the question of to what degree will other Asian countries be able to capitalize on Chinese economic weakness to get friend shoring, to get investment, to get market share, to become the new manufacturers of the, of the world. Yeah. Let's wrap on this. This has been a great deep dive. And um, yeah, as always, I'll see you, uh, see, see you next time. Thanks so much. It's always been fun. Econ 102 is a podcast from Turpentine, the network behind Moment of Zen, In the Arena, The Cognitive Revolution, and more. If you like what you hear, subscribe and leave us a review in the App Store. You can keep up with both of our Substacks for written analysis of the topics we cover in the show at noahopinion.substack.com and erictornberg.substack.com. Thanks for listening. <laughs>